Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Welcome back to my digital world segment brought to us by Tempest Network. And we're welcoming CEO of Tempest Network, Shahal Khan, our returning contributor. And today he is joined by Hirander Misra, CEO and co-founder of GMEX Group and one of the top 10 influential business leaders of blockchain technology. Hirander has extensive electronic trading and fintech expertise spanning 25 years with successful syndication to investors and substantial exits. Impressively, GMEX was also awarded winner of the best global hybrid finance fintech company 2022 in Acquisition International's Worldwide Finance Awards. Now, in this new financial landscape where fintech is reshaping the sector, blockchain development companies have a leg up. The adoption of the new economic model by users will have a major impact on the rate and scope of this transition. It's clear that the public is fed up with black boxes and wants control over how their data and money are transferred. Blockchain is a technology that makes it almost hard to change or break into a system by allowing the recording of information in a very secure manner. Digital ledgers, termed blocks, are used to keep track of transactions and assets in a business network using blockchain. And one of the most appealing features of this technology is its decentralized ownership, which is well known for democratizing processes while also providing security, transparency, and efficiency. And here to chat, FinTech, blockchain, and Web 3.0 are my experts at hand. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Nice to see you guys. All right, Herander, we'll start with you. Uh, GMEX Group is in its 10th anniversary year. And while your business started in traditional finance, uh, developing exchange matching engines, clearing settlement and custodial solutions per se, your firm was early to get involved in the digital asset space and did so back in 2017 with a subsequent launch of the GMEX Fusion. Um, you now have multiple solutions, including your multi-hub network of networks services, which bridges both traditional traditional and digital assets, removing the need to integrate with multiple venues and custodians. Now, this integrates with PyTor, which is a recent acquisition from ING, which is a highly secured digital asset custody solution and blockchain settlement network that is interoperable with multiple public and private chains. What does all of this actually mean for small businesses? How can we leverage this for the retail population and institutionally use what GMEX created to earn income and really create wealth in this ecosystem? And in the second part of the question, and take your time with this, how is PyTor revolutionizing fintech going into Web 3.0? You have a lot to dissect there. Take it away. Yeah, great, uh, great questions. I mean, everyone speaks about blockchain as you know one single ubiquitous technology, but actually, in reality, there's multiple blockchains, and in reality, traditional infrastructure that you know we've been using for many, many years. You know, whether it's to make payments, whether it's to trade on exchange, whether it's to settle transactions, it isn't going away anytime soon. I mean, the analogy I draw upon is you know we started writing letters and we had paper and pen. Uh, and then you know we moved to emails, and then we moved to instant messaging, and now we've got so many, so many different channels to to communicate. Uh, but how do you bring all these together in a meaningful way? Because it's a bit like you know you and I can make a make a phone call on our cell phones. It doesn't matter what mobile operator we're on, what what network we're on. We we can seamlessly talk to each other. The big problem in our industry, and this is kind of B two B or B two C, is that actually all these things are running as silos. And they don't actually talk to each other, and we're getting blinded by science out in the uh, in, in the market with lots of terminology. But in reality, you know, whether it's a consumer, uh, a retail user, whether it's an institution, they want to be able to do what they need to do. Um, you know, transact, create value, and and you know, be able to settle those transactions. Whether that's on exchange, whether that's uh, peer to peer with each other, uh, you know, all of this uh, is key, and that's what we're solving. We're kind of saying traditional finance isn't going away. Uh, we've got new forms of digital asset finance that can be centralized on a digital asset exchange, but it can also be decentralized with smart contracts, uh, but it seamlessly needs to talk to one another. Nice, nice. And this Pike Tour um, is really revolutionizing things as well. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because everyone talks about things like institutional grade or security. And of course, we all know that there's been 
various hacking attempts with um, you know blockchain infrastructure and smart smart contracts. You know what we liked. You know when we made this acquisition and we engaged with ING was you know here was a, a piece of technology and then an associated network that had been built by a bank for a range of financial institutions, whether it was banks, asset managers. Uh, and legal firms and other types of corporations that have been battle tested uh, under uh, a UK sandbox regulatory regime uh, with uh, multiple types of use cases. And, and what, what it did was two things. We, won, we all know digital custody is very, very important, but actually there's different forms of digital custody. It can be centralized. Uh, and and that, that's okay, you know, certain, certain offerings out there run that. But equally, whether it's retail users or other types of institutions, it can also be decentralized as well, where everyone's running wallets. But how do you control those and how do you use those assets uh, to trade? Um, uh, uh, even things like, you know, using them as collateral and b- being able to use them as credit without moving all these assets around, which can be it. energy inefficient and, um, and doesn't quite work uh, so well in periods of high volume. This is what it addresses, actually. It's it's quite revolutionary. Um, it's if you look at the bigger picture, this is going to change the the scope of how you know transactions are really going to occur seamlessly. Uh, Shahal, in the banking business, blockchain expenditure accounts for roughly thirty percent of total spending, according to Statista. And in this new financial landscape where fintech is really reshaping the sector, uh, we've said blockchain development companies have this leg up and it's clear that people do want to kind of change the way they're doing things and blockchain technology makes it you know almost hard to break into these systems but one of the most appealing features uh, of this technology is is the is its decentralized ownership which is well known for for what we've been talking about for forevermore demo- democratizing the processes right talk to me about where fintech is headed and if played out with the proper model does it have the potential to turn central banks upside down well look um the most important thing that we've always been focusing in on in all the projects that we're doing in this area is how do you allow a individual a um a identity to be correlated with the ability for that identity to have some sort of a value that is um, able to be verified um, across the board, you know, so that um, entity or that identity or that person that was not able to be banked or that person wasn't able to get into other jurisdictions and deal with other traders or deal with other financiers or, or, or other counterparties now could do it because they're actually uh, having a verification identity, a KYC, an AML. They're able to put all their assets uh, in, a, in a verifiable format, right? Um, the majority of the world is, is, is not banked or they have such small assets that um, uh, they really don't uh, value. I mean, I hate to say this, but th- they're not of value to the larger financial systems. And, you know, the world's got to now move to that area where the three and a half billion people or the four billion people that are unbanked or, or, or have assets but are, aren't able to gain any sort of value out of those assets are able to do so now. Yeah. That turns everything uh, upside down when it comes to central banks that are essentially a pyramidical, you know, sort of way of designing where the capital the currency is created at the top and filters down, you know, towards the larger bottom. This way around where I see the future is when it's the bottom and the assets at the bottom are now correlated, verified and put on a verifiable chain. They can then group together. People can group together uh, as they're doing, for example, in guilds or communities or DAOs or whatever you want to call them, but in crowds and come together with larger forms of asset value and, you know, put them into, let's say, uh, joint custodianships and then trade or create their own sort of financing banks. Like we used to have, you know, uh, savings and loans in the United States a long time ago, which was designed just for this. So people didn't rely on a central banking system, but they relied on each other or their community. And I think because of all the geopolitical strain and the debt strain on central banks, uh, this is a way that where, where people are going to have to uh, bank with each other in the future or trade with each other, you know, each other in the future if they don't want to be under the central banking regime or have an alternative to it. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then when you're looking at, uh, at the at the safety that these platforms are providing, Herander, this is a very fitting a question for you, really, because the platforms which were built uh, to provide accurate reporting and monitoring and analysis of all all forms of digital financial transactions. These are an intriguing use of blockchain technology, obviously, but in order for fintech companies to communicate and transmit secure and unmodified data over a decentralized network, blockchain really helps to manage data breaking and other fraudulent activities, so to speak. And it helps to keep data safe even when encrypted and makes it really easier to monitor, understand, and audit the AI choices, allowing humans to trust machine-driven intelligence, which is really kind of a huge step that we're gonna need to take if, if this is going to work effectively. But when blockchain technology is used in fintech applications, uh, money may be transferred in a matter of minutes, regardless of the quantity. So direct you know, P2P transactions with no intermediary may be made possible via blockchain and via powered finance apps using blockchain. Talk to me about how this very notion is going to come in and basically revolutionize GameFi, for say. Yeah, excellent question. I mean, you know, one thing which we've discussed is the old and the new ha has to coexist. And that's really, really important. And, you know, what technology fragments, technology can knit together as well. And, you know, Shahal mentioned, you know, the need to democratize finance. Uh, and, you know, what does that mean uh, in reality? It's very, very interesting what's happening on the gaming side where th there's a lot of play to earn activity in Shahal with what he's doing with Tempest and partners is very much um, involved in that. At the same time, these users earn out of these games uh, and they might earn tokens and other forms of uh, digital assets. Yet um, each asset isn't really uh, compatible or you know, a term I call fungible with any other asset, but equally they still got to pay the rent, whether it's in US dollars or, or anything else and buy food, right? So how do they convert those assets into fiat currency or convert fiat currency into crypto uh, or some of those assets as well, right? And all of this is effectively um, needing a form of exchange uh, that's very efficient. But that notion of just an exchange being centralized goes away because an exchange could be, you know, you as an individual wanting to exchange your assets that you earn in game with um, assets that someone else has or assets on a platform that exists somewhere else or by way of a smart contract, whether it's dealing with entities or individuals, right? Now, uh, what, what what's good about what we're doing and this sort of technology is, is that we're moving into a world where this very much becomes a reality. Now, what does that mean, actually? I mean, in reality, it means that actually as a gamer or any kind of retail user, you can now access finance to a greater extent, as Shahal um, alluded to, and there's a democratization of finance. On the other hand, you know, why should institutions care? You know, if you're a, if you're a leading tier one asset manager, um, you know, why should you care? Well, actually, on the wealth management side or, you know, what the banks are doing, a lot of their own offerings have become commoditized. They're actually much the same. And they're all looking at new forms of activity, liquidity, and new forms of volume. So actually, when they can integrate with uh, wallets and these types of users, it really leads to great opportunity for them because they can tokenize assets and distribute them as well. Uh, those new forms of users have now found access to new forms of finance. And there you go, GameFi is really born. Rather there you than go. The hype that we see. I love that. I love how you segued into that. That was the perfect ending to a great statement. I want to thank you both for coming on. We are out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Shahal, for bringing on an incredible guest. Herander, always a pleasure. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you, Zen. That was My Digital World brought to us by Tempest Network. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Tempest, the next generation of the engagement economy, allowing people to make money on their data and earn cryptocurrency for the time they spend on things they already currently love to do. With Tempest, brands will have the ability to pay you directly for interacting with apps, watching videos, playing games, and more. Tempest, the time is now. Engage and earn. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Welcoming back to my digital world segment brought to us by Tempest Network. We have our returning contributor, Shahal Khan, joined by his good friend, Harander Misra. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Pleasure to be here, Zen. Hi, Zen. All right, Shahal, um, it's no news that really th th that fees and other maintenance-related charges have allowed 
a large percentage of the population to gradually lose interest in banks and really any form of digital payments. We've been talking about this for for quite some time now. And a report by the World Bank revealed that about one third of adults, uh, 1.7 billion adults remain unbanked without an account at any financial institution or through a mobile money provider, okay? Now, by connecting world payment services through the technology of blockchain, the convenience of payments can be improved and thereby create opportunities for people to engage with blockchain technology, as you mentioned in your previous answer. But it seems to me that this is going to pave the way out of poverty for many. How will governments react to this autonomy and what effect do you feel this will have on economies? You know, governments um, have to look at uh, essentially earned income and taxable income uh, from, from individuals at their, at their purest form of existence, right? Um, anything beyond that starts to get into some sort of really um, edgy areas of government interference in terms of economy um, of the individual, right? Um, in, in, in what's going on in today's world, uh, people require uh, modes of income that are keeping up with inflation, that, that, that are keeping up with the rising costs. Um, what we hope is going to happen is there's going to be new innovative ways of earning income and working on uh, essentially the economic enablement of the web uh, beyond just e-commerce, right? So people are able to be identified, they're able to have a value of their work, and they're able to be compensated for that work in a virtual environment, anywhere they are in the world. So that means they, they have to have an identity, they have to have a digital bank account, they have to be tied to, let's say, a regional exchange, and that regional exchange has to be tied to other exchanges that talk to each other so they can start to um, get compensated with, uh, you know, different assets, NFTs or other cryptos, um, you know, that uh, that companies can, you know, uh, uh, compensate them with. Um, and that requires this entire infrastructure we're talking about. Governments, at the end of the day, uh, want to ensure that this is all verified and this is monitored so they can take their pound of flesh, right, from the local resident. As long as we're able to show governments, and this is where GMEX comes in because it is the only one out there um, in terms of a, uh, uh, an exchange that enables regulators to work on both sides where a traditional exchange can tie into, let's say, a crypto exchange, but you can actually have the verification result of what the person is doing, right? Amazing. And if that person wants to be able then to uh, pay their taxes, and, and if the government wants those taxes from that person, they have the verification capabilities that'll be, you know, uh, within the system, right? Because you're, 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 you're working within a regulated environment. Yeah. And I think that is key to find a middle ground and to make a lot of these sort of ideas real, um, and beneficial for all, including governments, obviously. Yeah. Wow, that was such an amazing answer because between the two of you, Harander and Yushahal, in this segment alone, you have come up with more solutions to solve real world issues and really help the unbanked and or underbanked, but really give power back to the people in a controlled manner where it's transparent and both, you know, both parties are happy. That to me, these are the disruptive companies that I love to always look under the hood. Uh, and I think GMEX is, you're right, one of them. Harander, my hat goes off to you, buddy. Uh, let's talk about cross-border transactions, all right? So traditional cross-border transactions remain one of the most inconvenient consumer transactions plagued with delayed processing times and exorbitant fees and a lack of transparency, right? But transfers between smaller banks into different countries can be extremely expensive. We know that, and that's even worse, and slow due to the reliance on intermediaries and interbank relationships. And a recent report by Juniper Research revealed that banks will reduce the cost of cross-border payments by 
$10 billion in the year 2030 and also improve payment transparency and traceability by using blockchain technology. So your company's headed on the right track. But more so, blockchain adoption is expected to increase over the next decade with 2 billion cross-border transactions to be facilitated by blockchain by the year 2030. And as blockchain networks continue to build, um, a ton of positive statistics are going to force creep up about blockchain technology. What do you say to this with respect to what you're doing at GMEX and how are you solving the cross-border transaction fiasco? Excellent uh, question. Uh, I mean, much like, um, you know, what, what Shahal talks about, you know, with central banks and then need for improvement, you know, whether there's a central bank digital currency or, or not in any jurisdiction, one of the things we've got to actually realize and acknowledge is actually there's no such thing as a global bank. There's no such thing as a global exchange or a global custodian, and regulations can be different in each of the countries they operate. Um, you know, certain initiatives out there that were quite high profile that talked about kind of a seamless stable coin, you know, came a cropper just because they didn't acknowledge that fact. So what that means is, you know, those different nodes uh, need to be kind of knitted together in a way that they uh, talk to each other efficiently. And that could be traditional payments because that isn't going away with SWIFT network. Um, obviously, with the geopolitics out there, uh, other jurisdictions are also creating their own networks uh, between them, some of them blockchain-based, uh, some, some not. Uh, but in reality, it shouldn't take three to seven days to send a fiat payment, you know, in one currency uh, and see it in a bank account uh, in, an, in in another country in a completely different currency, with um, lots and lots of charges that actually, you know, given uh, as a percentage of the transaction, become very very high, untenable. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, with technology these days, that construct, you know, which is decades old, you know, because it's running on kind of IBM mainframes and legacy technology. Um, you know, technology is advanced now. I mean, we can just see that with mobile phones uh, over the last decade, I mean, let alone two or three decades, and even laptop computing. Um, yet, you know, we do this day in, day out, and the back-end plumbing just isn't up to the job. So I think uh, in this day and age now, um, with what we're doing with infrastructure, it makes it seamless to uh, affect a transaction. And that could be, let's say, fiat uh, being transferred somewhere, um, converted into crypto, uh, at an optimal rate, but e equally that crypto then in turn being used to purchase uh, securities, uh, and those securities could either be uh, you know digital securities or traditional securities, and so all in all you end up with um, you know smart contracts and atomic swaps, as well as being able to kind of access central liquidity pools that are more like traditional or or, or CFI type exchanges, uh, centralized finance exchanges, and all of this becomes seamless, and it and it's done in a way where each of those nodes as regulated entities on either side um, so that you're orchestrating that interaction in the middle. Incredible. Incredible. You know, it, there's there's very few times where I look at companies and I, I get really excited because usually it would be a lipstick company or a beauty company or maybe even something in the metaverse that's really flashy with graphics. But in this particular case, when you look at GMAX and you look at what you're doing and you look at the real applications and, and, and the, the solutions that you're providing for the infrastructure that we need to be able to move into, you know, even Web 3.0 or even have a lot of this facilitated in a more fluid way because there's been so many roadblocks in this particular industry in fintech. But what you're doing is, is fascinating. So I'm very excited about it. And it's just to me, every time you, you're telling me about how you're solving another real world issue, it's really translating to saving money in my pocket. So Good job. Uh, we are out of we are out of time, and I wanted to thank you again for coming on, Shahal. Thank you for bringing on Harander. Great guest, Harander. Thank you so much for giving us so much insight into this. What could be a very complicated topic, but you simplified it as best you could. So thank you. My pleasure, Zen. Thank you. Thank you, Shahal. Thanks a lot, Zen. Thanks, Harander. Thanks, guys. You definitely have to check out Harando Misra, CEO and co-founder of GMEX Group and one of the top 10 influential business leaders of blockchain technology. Definitely head to their website, gmex-group.com and tempest.network. That was our My Digital World segment brought to us by Tempest Network. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this.